Batman 89, Shadows. Based on the comic written by Sam Hamm, with art by Joe Quinones, Leonardo Ito, and Clayton Cowles. Adapted by Ben Wan. It was Halloween in Gotham City. For years, criminals had terrorized the citizens into staying home on this night. But that was before Gotham City had Batman. Now the people felt safe enough to have a public celebration. Gotham Square was packed with citizens dressed as their hero. But at the Yanis restaurant, there were two people who weren't so worried about ghosts and goblins. District Attorney Harvey Dent sat down with his girlfriend, Barbara Gordon, the daughter of Police Commissioner James Gordon. Oh, this is good, Harvey. Too good. Are we on the city's tab? No, ma'am. There will be no city business discussed at this table. It's a special occasion. What kind of special occasion? Well... Harvey passed over a small ring box. She opened it. Oh, Harvey, I wasn't expecting- Take it off. Think it over. Maybe this will help you decide. He gave her a silver dollar, a token from his childhood growing up in the neighborhood of Burnside. Heads, yes. Tails, no. (laughs) I'm feeling lucky. Did you really just give me a two-headed coin? Keep it because my answer is yes. Just then, they heard an explosion in the distance. Harvey and Barbara rushed over to the windows to see what was going on. A gang of criminals wearing clown makeup resembling the late criminal, the Joker, had just blown up a bridge. Two armored cars belonging to Lincoln Savings and Loan had fallen below. Other members of the gang arrived in a helicopter, attaching hooks to airlift the armored cars out of the rubble. On the rooftop, far above, Stone gargoyles gazed down, keeping watch of the crime. One of the gargoyles moved. It landed on the armored car, revealing the caped figure of Batman. He immediately fired his grappling hook, snagging the car on one of the buildings, causing the helicopter to go down from the weight. The gang members panicked and parachuted out as the helicopter crashed. Down below, Batman landed in front of the Lincoln Savings and Loan building. The Joker gang opened fire on him. Thinking quickly, Batman saw the bank's mascot, a giant Lincoln's head penny. He threw his battery, dislodging it. The giant penny rolled in front of him, blocking him from the gunfire until it crashed into a wall. Then the Joker gang members heard the roar of an engine. A sleek, demonic car arrived, the Batmobile. The cockpit opened, and Batman jumped inside. The Batmobile charged right towards the gang. They ran off, only to find themselves caught in the spotlight of a police helicopter carrying Commissioner Gordon. This is the police. This area has been secured. Do not attempt to leave. As the police rounded up the suspects, Gordon saw the Batmobile drive off and smiled to himself. Back outside the Yanis restaurant, Harvey and Barbara attempted to walk home when a member of the Joker gang grabbed Barbara's purse and ran. Harvey chased after him. Harvey! He followed the criminal down an alley where he was surprised by a second Joker gang member. Hold it. Hand over the Rolex. Hey, no problem. I don't want any trouble. Harvey had slipped his Rolex into his hand and punched the criminal, picking up his gun and pointing it back at his attackers. Don't shoot, mister. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't that funny? I just can't decide what to do. I think I'll toss a coin. Heads, you die. Tails, you walk. From yards away, Barbara heard the sound and ran over, only to find Harvey firing the gun in the air. The Joker members were fleeing. It's all right, Barbara. I just wanted to scare him. Scare them? You could have been killed. Harvey, I can replace a purse, but I could never replace you. She embraced him. 
As Harvey looked off, however, he saw the Batmobile passing by. He watched with resentment. To him, this was all Batman's fault. The next morning, Batman's civilian identity, Bruce Wayne, slept in bed. In his dreams, he was reuniting with the woman he met last Christmas, Selina Kyle, the Catwoman. You have no idea how long I've been waiting to do this. But as she went in to kiss him, Bruce woke up to see his black cat, who was licking him awake. Last Christmas, Bruce had attempted to find Selina, only to find her cat instead, wearing a red collar, identifying her with the name Miss Kitty. Bruce had adopted her as a reminder of Selina, with the hope that someday he'd see her again. As he got up, his faithful butler, Alfred, was opening up the curtains. Sorry to rouse you, sir. You seem to be having a pleasant dream. Uh, for once. Where's breakfast? Downstairs. You have a visitor. Bruce came down to the kitchen. Harvey Dent had come to see his old friend at Wayne Manor. What's on your mind, Harvey? The city's in chaos. I have a way to fix it, but I'm going to need help. With your backing, we're going to take down Batman. Harvey then told Bruce what had happened on Halloween night. The whole fiasco cost 26 million in property damage alone. The Joker's gone, but criminals are still copying him. All Batman's done is cause more of these knuckleheads to come out the woodwork. This is Gordon's mess in trusting that vigilante. It's time he owned up to it. I'd like to help Harvey, but Jim Gordon and I go a long way back. Well, there's no hurry. If you don't mind troops in the streets. Troops? You haven't heard? We've called in the National Guard, and we're having city council put in a vote for no confidence to kick Gordon out. I promised I'd make this city safe for decent people. And that's what I'm going to do. After Harvey left, Bruce felt disturbed by his friend's words. Mr. Dent is a man on a crusade, very much like yourself. I'm not turning on Jim Gordon. I'm well aware. But if I may say, sir, I think the district attorney has a point. Alfred, if I really think I'm doing more harm than good, I'll quit. That night, Batman watched over Gotham as he communicated to Commissioner Gordon over the back-channel communication system. Look, I'm not long for this job. The channel we're on may be compromised. So one last piece of advice. Stay off the streets. The National Guard has orders to bring you in. If I don't see you again, thanks. We tried. As Gordon destroyed his headset, Batman remembered the night years ago when his parents were murdered by Jack Napier. As the police arrived, only one officer took the time to comfort him, putting a hand on his shoulders. It's okay, son. You'll be okay. As the memory faded away, Batman spoke, knowing that the commissioner would never hear him. Thank you. Then Batman heard the sound of gunshots and leapt off the roof seeing a shopkeeper with a gun chase after a thief. As the National Guard cornered the shopkeeper to drop his weapon, Batman followed the thief to an apartment building. He peeked in through the windows and saw an unexpected sight. The man was holding a crying baby. Don't cry, Naisha. I brought you some peas and sweet potatoes. Batman stepped in through the window. Please, man. Don't hurt Naisha. She didn't do nothing. I'm not gonna hurt you. Where's the money you took? Money? No, you gotta believe me. All I took was diapers and baby food. Naisha's hungry. Batman heard a sound from the fire escape. Going to investigate it, he peeked out, only for him to see a giant boot hit him in the face. Batman sprawled back as a masked figure in a green and yellow costume dropped down. Not your house, man. Next time, no. With another surprise kick, the figure knocked Batman off the fire escape. 
Batman felt dazed. This must have been what criminals felt when he attacked. He fired his grappling gun, slowing his fall. Back inside, the other masked figure turned to the thief and handed him cash. Sorry for the trouble here. What's this? Eight bucks. It's all I got. Down below, the National Guard, who had finished dealing with the shopkeeper, ran over to find Batman. Hold it right there! I said, hold it right there! True to Gordon's warning, they took aim at him. Thinking quickly, Batman threw a gas pellet, clouding their vision as he used the grappling gun to propel him up against the side of the building. Up there! I can see him! Batman threw down a flash grenade, blinding the National Guardsman as the grappling gun moved him past the fire escape. Standing out there was the thief, peeking to see what was going on as the National Guard opened fire, shooting blindly. Get down! But a stray bullet hit the man in the neck, sending him falling off the ledge of the fire escape. Batman tried to reach out for him, but he was too late. He watched in horror as the man fell to the sidewalk. Back at the Batcave, Alfred found Bruce Wayne, still in the bat suit, but with his cowl off. For the first time in a while, he seemed defeated. Master Bruce. Sir, I, I screwed up, Alfred. This time, uh, I, I well and truly screwed up. The next day, Harvey Dent met with Barbara at a park, who had been going through the police evidence on Batman. Okay, Santa Claus, what have you got? This looks kind of like a cross between a boomerang and a throwing star, with what looks to be a computerized targeting system. It was the batarang used to frame Batman in the Ice Princess kidnapping last Christmas. Barbara threw it. It came back. She then handed it to Harvey. How does this thing work? It locks in on a unique heat signature. Throw it at the bench. Harvey did, but it hit him in the shoulder. Ow! <laughs> huh, I must have had it locked on you by mistake. Hmm, <laughs> by mistake. What else have you got? There's a couple of detachable fenders that somehow got knocked off his muscle car when the cops chased him last Christmas. Hmm. I think I know someone who could help us with these. Harvey drove to his childhood neighborhood in Burnside. At the Royal Garage, he tracked down a young mechanic and computer whiz who worked there named Drake Winston. I hear you've got a photographic memory for car parts, Drake. I've got some parts from, let's say, an exotic model. I'd like to know if they were modified from a production car or a machine from scratch. Exotic? Nah, I don't think I can help you. Did I do something to upset you? You're a cop, Mr. Dent. I'm, I'm sure you're a very nice cop, but you're a cop. As Drake walked away, Harvey saw the owner of the garage, Jerome Otis, come in. He had heard the whole conversation. Mr. Otis was a father figure not only to Drake, but also to Harvey when he was younger. Can't blame the boy. Kids around here don't see you at all, Harvey. You've been moving with a different crowd. I know where I came from. Always have. But to roll with that crowd, I have to hide my real face. The clothes, the car, it's all a costume. What exactly are you trying to be? You know Jerome. Big man. Back in the old days, Mr. Otis would use the two-headed coin to play a game with Harvey. I'm gonna flip this coin, Harvey. Heads, you grow up to be a big man. Tails, you're nothing but a bum. Call it. Heads? Heads! Ha! Big man! Again. Let's do it again. Yahweh's called heads and Yahweh's won. 
and you never even asked to look at the coin. Most gullible child I ever did see. Nah, it's just that I trusted you. Still do. I hope so, son, because the council just arrived. A group of prominent community leaders entered the garage. Mr. Otis led the meeting, discussing the recent events. We lost one in the hospital. There's a child orphaned. I want a lid on this neighborhood. People need to express their anger, yes, but peacefully. No violence and no excuses. I want to help, however I can. As the council meeting continued, a group of movers arrived at Wayne Manor, much to Alfred's surprise. They were bringing in the giant penny that Batman had used to shield himself the other night. Alarmed, Alfred went down to the Batcave to talk to Bruce. I want to move it down here. Brighten the place up a little. Down here, sir. A giant penny. It saved my life. Is that all right with you? Sorry, Alfred, but the kid's dead. The girl's alone, and I have no way of making it right. This self-imposed hiatus is not helping your disposition, sir. But you're lucky enough to have options. On those rare occasions when vigilantism fails, you can always resort to philanthropy. As Alfred spoke, Bruce looked at the screens on the Bat computer, where he saw Harvey Dent making a speech to the community. People of Burnside, I come to you as one of you. I was born here and grew up here on Baltimore Avenue, just a few blocks away. We all know there are two Gothams, and I can tell you it's true, because I've lived in both. Drake Winston walked past Dent's speech, ignoring it. He had been too used to politicians making empty promises. As he walked through the neighborhood, he spotted a gang breaking through a shop window. He ran off, donning a green and yellow costume, the costume of the vigilante who attacked Batman. Since he was still wearing his mechanic uniform underneath, he had the letter R on his chest, the logo of the Royal Garage. Drake ran back to the crime scene and began fighting the gang. Bystanders ran up to watch as the gang tried to frame the masked man for the crime. Over here. We caught this punk. He was robbing the store. What did you say, fool? Say it again. I said he was robbing the... Oh! When Drake finished with the gang, he turned to the bystanders. Turn him into the cops, if he rode that way. Or, there's a dumpster around the corner with the dead boat on the latch. Watch over Mr. Boucham's store. With the gang thwarted, Drake ran away. The bystanders looked at each other, wondering who the masked man was. Who was that guy? They had noticed the R on his chest and thought they heard the gang member call him Robin. Later that night, the gang met back at their hideout, licking their wounds. One of the gang members returned, reporting that he had followed the masked man home and knew exactly where he lived. The Royal Garage in Burnside. As they planned their revenge, Harvey had brought Bruce Wayne to the garage to meet with Mr. Otis and the council. So let me see if I understand what Harvey's telling us. You're proposing to stake every school-age child in the Burnside district to four years of Gotham State University at your expense? If I may ask, Mr. Wayne, why the sudden interest in Burnside? Harvey's speech, two Gothams existing in the same place. It struck a chord with me. And, of course, the young man who was shot. The little girl, Naisha, who was orphaned. You may not know this, but I've lost members of my own family to gun violence. We all know what that's like. Same here. Yeah, me too. Systemic problems take generations to fix, but there are some problems you can fix with money. That's where I can help. Up above, Drake Winston listened, then turned away. He had heard enough empty promises. We'd like to think on your generous offer, if we might consider this the start of an ongoing discussion. Call me anytime. As the meeting was dismissed, Bruce went back to his car, only to hear screams. The garage! It's on fire! Help! Somebody! Fire! 
Bruce immediately opened the trunk. He couldn't change in the bat suit out in the open, but he could disguise himself with a ski mask he had packed for emergencies for times he was caught without the costume. He ran towards the fire only to hear a scream in the nearby alley. Bruce followed the sound, only to stop in his track. On the floor lay the gang who had started the fire, their faces all slashed by the woman standing in the alley. A woman Batman hadn't seen since last Christmas. Catwoman. Hi, honey. I'm home. Selena? She took a spray can and sprayed the word arson on a nearby dumpster. I know you're keeping a low profile, federales and all, so I'll just stick your little buddies in the dumpster. You've got fires to put out anyway. I think fires are romantic. Don't you? Back at the Royal Garage, Harvey Dent, Barbara Gordon, and Mr. Otis stood outside the fire in horror. Wait, Drake's in there. His room, it's up top, over the body shop. He was gonna take a nap. I'll get him. Harvey, no. I love you. I'll be fine. Harvey! But Harvey was already going in. Inside, he searched through the flames. <coughs> Drink! <coughs> Drink! As Harvey attempted to go up the stairs to find Drake, the stairwell collapsed. The flames surrounded his body. A brown liquid from a busted car battery started trickling its way towards him. Harvey lost consciousness, but he began seeing a glimpse of different visions. Visions of his hopes and dreams coming true, starting with him carrying Drake out of the building. I had you figured all wrong. Thanks for saving my life. Mr. Dean. The governor announced today that he will not seek re-election. Speculation now centers on Gotham D.A. Harvey Dent, who came to national attention when he risked his life to save a young man in Birdside. Why couldn't wait until the weekend to see you, Governor Dent? But as the visions faded, he heard another voice, the familiar sound of his friend, Bruce Wayne. Cover your face. Don't breathe it in. That's car battery acid. As Harvey came to, he saw that Bruce and Drake were dragging him out of the building. We've got about five seconds before this place goes up. Bruce and Drake got Harvey out just as the garage exploded. Dusting themselves off, Bruce and Drake got up, recovered. Good job. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. Regaining strength, Harvey tried to get up. Barbara, <laughs> have to make a speech. As he stood, the crowd was horrified by what they saw. Oh my gosh. Harvey! Oh, Harvey, no! Barbara, there's something wrong. Face. Half of Harvey's face had been burned from the acid in the garage. Harvey. As Harvey collapsed, the paramedics arrived and put him in a stretcher. Before she joined them in the ambulance, Barbara thanked Bruce. Thank you for saving him. I'll never forget it. We'll need you. Bruce turned away to see Drake talking to Mr. Otis and the others. I was on the roof when the fire broke down feeding my birds. I think I saw the dudes that did it, though. They were running up the street, turning the corner. Wait, could you identify them? I don't know. I was way high up. But I had a real clear look at the street. Bruce stopped at his tracks, noticing Drake eyeing him. If Drake had seen him on the street, then he had seen Bruce with Cap. Cops just found a few suspects in a dumpster. Somebody roughed them up pretty good. Bruce looked up at the roof nearby as the familiar figure of Catwoman gave him a flirty wave before disappearing into the night. Bruce wondered why she had decided to show herself after all this time, and what she was up to.
Later that night in the hospital, Harvey Dent lay in bed with bandages over his face. He then heard a voice. His voice. Harvey. Harvey. What? Who? I'm you, Harvey. But not in this world. The other world. The one you gotta peek at. See, whenever an event has two possible outcomes, the universe splits. Both things happen in separate branches of reality. In my world, I saved Drake. I'm a hero. And now I'm running for governor. In my world, all your dreams are coming true. Whatever can happen does happen somewhere. Think of the power and the choices you make. You can literally split the universe in two with something as simple as the toss of a coin. The vision of his other self showed the coin before fading away as Barbara came back into the room. I'm back, darling. Honey, I need my coin. Of course. I've been taking good care of it. It's the reason we're engaged. Do you have a nail file? Sure. Here. Why? Harvey! Harvey had started using the file to add marks on one side of the coin. This coin has no power. I'm fixing it. You need two possible outcomes. Yes. No. Good. Bad. Black. White. She loves me. She loves me not. Harvey, no. You know I love you. It doesn't matter what the- She loves me. That turned out nicely. This universe works for me. But after a day went by in Harvey's recovery, his behavior became more erratic. Barbara turned to Bruce Wayne for help in her next visit. The people are marching for me in the streets, Bruce. They need me. I have to- Darling, don't worry about that now. We have to make a decision. Bruce, tell him. There's a team of plastic surgeons. Best in the world. But it would mean flying you to Switzerland. Switzerland? Stay or go. Stay or... Where's my coin? Your coin? Harvey, this is one of the most important decisions we'll make in our entire lives. We can't leave it up to a coin. I died, Barbara. I died in the garage fire. I died in the alley where the punk stole your purse. But for some reason, this universe is keeping me alive. Stay or go. Stay. I'm sorry, go. Bruce. I don't know what's gotten into him. Stay. Keep talking to him, Barbara. Go. We need Stay Harvey Dent back. Go. Stay. Go. As Barbara escorted Bruce out, Harvey caught the coin. It had landed on the scarred side. That night, as an orderly was making his rounds, an IV pole struck him on the side of the head, knocking him down. Harvey stood over him and took his key card to enable him to leave. As he did so, he began to remove the bandages and look in the reflection. Staring back at him, he saw that the other side of his face had acid scars. His lips had peeled back, revealing his teeth, and the voice in the reflection suddenly talked back in a voice he didn't recognize. What are you gawking at, pretty boy? Across town at the Gotham City Police Headquarters, Barbara Gordon received an odd email. Who robbed Lincoln Savings and Loan? Lincoln Savings and Loan? Who sent this? From dirty old Bastet. Bastet. Like the cat god? <sighs> Harvey's, uh, disappeared, Barbara. That's impossible. I know. But I just heard the doorman at your building saw a man who looked like dead. Had a key. He, uh, let himself in, was 
trying to cover his face. What? Don't worry. I got guys heading over there now. At Barbara's apartment, Harvey Dent looked into his personal laptop. Just like his fiance, he had received a cryptic email as well with information on the bank heist that Batman had foiled. Lincoln Savings and Loan robbed itself? Hey. Hey! Hello? Anyone in here? With lightning speed, Harvey took Barbara's files and fled. The police chased after him. Harvey headed down into the subway, with a new voice in his head guiding him towards a hiding spot. The cops soon lost Harvey, who looked around, recognizing an abandoned station that he had remembered as a kid. One side clean, the other run down and dirty. Don't feel bad, Harvey. A week from now, we'll have everything we need to help our friends and destroy our enemies. And then, we'll both be happy. As Harvey Dent was making plans, Drake Winston visited Bruce at Wayne Manor to talk about the criminals who had set fire to the Royal Garage. Listen, Mr. Wayne, you saw those arsonists. You can identify them. They go to jail, people get justice. I can't. I made a sworn statement to the police. But you were lying. You put on a mask, chased them around the corner and beat them. Look, kid, that's not what happened. Mr. Wayne, please. There's too much at stake. I think I understand your problem here, but you have to tell me the truth. All right, all right. I, I, I did go around the corner, okay? And what I saw was Catwoman. Catwoman beat those men. <laughs> Catwoman did it? Oh, man, you're killing me. Catwoman? Catwoman's an urban legend, man. We both know who did it, and we both know why you can't admit it. Go home, kid. Mm, suits me. But first, I brought you a present. Battery acid. Same stuff that took off Dent's face. Hope it wouldn't come to this, but if you don't tell me the truth, then I'm just gonna have to. As Drake twisted the cap off the vial, Bruce tackled him, flipping him into the bookcase. Drake got up and charged at Bruce. Bruce grabbed the table nearby and hit Drake with it, causing it to break in half. Drake fell back, but not before throwing the vial. It splashed on Bruce, who winced at first, until he felt his face. Relax. You're fine. It's just water, Batman. Freeze! Alfred had barged into the room, wielding a taser. Alfred, help Mr. Winston up. Ah, uh, sir. It's okay, Mr. Alfred. He owed me one from the fire escape. Bruce looked at Drake, remembering the vigilante who had attacked him as Batman. Now he knew who was behind the mask. How did you know? Back at the garage when you were making that speech to Dent and the council, you knew the little girl's name, Nasha. So, why didn't you turn me in? I was gonna, but you ran into that burning building to save Mr. Dent, so I Figured you want to make amends. See, terrorizing bad guys, it's fine, I get it. But it's a dead end. You gotta inspire people to stand up on their own, to make the kind of world they want to live in. But we can talk philosophy all night. I really just want to see the car. Bruce led Drake down the stairs into the Batcave where he saw the giant Lincoln's head penny. Close to it was the Batmobile. Man, how much did this place cost you? It was here before. I just fixed it up a little. Oh my goodness. Drake had his eyes set on a very different vehicle close to the Batmobile. One that looked like a prototype motorcycle. She's new. Needs a couple of tweaks. 
Okay, Mr. Wayne. I can't ask you to write yourself out. You've got too much to lose. I understand that now. But with all these gangs on the street, this town's gonna boil over. Unless somebody keeps the lid on. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna need a helper. Bruce let himself smirk. A partnership was formed. One night later, a member of the Joker gang found himself tied up, held hostage by Harvey Dent. I I want my lawyer present. Lawyer? (laughs) Please. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm not actually here in my official capacity as district attorney. Harvey looked down at his coin. It had the scarred side up. Instead, think of me as a prospective employer. To put it simply, I need your clown crew. Later, Barbara Gordon came home from work to find her father, Commissioner Gordon, in her apartment. Barbara, I need to know if he's contacted you in any way. Of course not. I'm a cop, Dad. I would have reported it. I want him brought in. He needs help. Did Harvey say anything to you about Lincoln's savings and loan? The files he stole were... Stole? Last I checked, he was still the duly elected DA. Fair enough. I... Tried and convicted already. That's how we do it in Gotham. No thought for the good in his heart or the suffering he's... Barbara, listen. Everything you said about me was right. I chose expediency over principle. I let you down. I let everyone down. I've handed in my resignation. Effective Monday. I truly hope things work out for you and Harvey. There are never enough idealists in our line of work. The job chews them up and spits them out. But maybe you'll be different. It was the proudest day of my life when you joined the force. I just wish I'd lived up to your opinion of me. Before Barbara could react, her father left. As she was about to follow, she noticed a note left hidden under her newspaper. It was from Harvey. Darling, the park, our spot, 11 p.m. Thursday. If I'm not there, it means I'm dead. I love you. Harvey. An hour later, the AA line in downtown Gotham suddenly crashed into rubble. An alert came from within the Bat computer. Batman was out on patrol and radioed in. What have you got for me, Alfred? Explosion, sir. Four subway tunnels collapsed from causes as yet undetermined. I should note that all four sites are roughly equidistant from police headquarters. Bad sign. Next to Batman on a rooftop was Drake Winston, clad in an upgraded suit of armor with an R still on his chest. We may need the cycle. I thought you said the cycle wasn't ready. You're not ready. I'm not going to get you killed. Emerging from its cocoon in the Bat Cave came the Bat Cycle. It started up and headed out. Over in Gotham, Jerome Otis led the Burnside community in a march to honor Harvey Dent. Gunshots suddenly rang out. Everyone ducked for cover as the Joker gang shot sniper rifles from above causing panic and distracting the Gotham City Police Department. Through the chaos, the gang ran into the building, and Mr. Otis saw their leader. Harvey? 
Harvey Dent now was wearing a suit that was black on one side and white with pinstripes on the other, but he wasn't calling himself Harvey anymore. From now on, he was adopting the name Two-Face. We're in, gentlemen. Spread out. If you need me, I'll be in the evidence room. The Joker gang made their way to the rooftop of police headquarters, where Commissioner Gordon was shining the bat signal for help. Hey, Pappy, waiting for a bad boy to come and save you? <clears throat> Annette shot out a close over one gang member. The other criminal turned as Batman arrived, punching him. He landed right on the bat signal, out cold. Nice to see you, Batman. What's this about? The loot from the Lincoln Savings Job. It's still down in the evidence room. We've also got a sniper or two across the street. Batman spoke into his wrist communicator. You picking this up? I'll see what I can do about that. Who are you talking to? My intern. Let's get you to safety. With all due respect, I'm on the job till Monday. This is still my turf. There's a long way down, and a short way down. After a moment's hesitation, Gordon grabbed onto Batman, who used his cape glider to bring them to the ground. Across the street, a Joker sniper had looked out for victims to target when Drake crashed through the window behind him and knocked him. Then he went off to find the next sniper. Back in the GCPD evidence room, Two-Face wheeled out the stolen $31 million in cash from Lincoln Savings and Loan. Time's up. Move out. Hey, hey scumbag. Into the line for you. Detective Bullock fired at Two-Face, who took cover before firing back, hitting the detective in the side. Enough dawdling. Grab your gear and- Hold it right there, Harvey. Two-Face turned to see Commissioner Gordon pointing his firearm at him. Next to him stood Batman, who had frozen. Under the cowl, Bruce was shocked at what his friend had become. Drop the weapon, Harvey. Well, well, well. A boy and his thug. I was half hoping you'd show up. I always knew you were ambitious, but this is downright unconscionable. Batman took aim at Two-Face. From his forearm was a dart gun that would shoot out a tranquilizer. You know what they say. Cops and criminals cut from the same cloth. Two-Face then swung the remote control battering that Barbara had given him, hitting Batman, who fired the tranquilizer dart hitting Commissioner Gordon in the neck. Ah! Two-Face caught the battering as Batman looked on in horror. Somehow I knew this would come in handy. Now listen closely, Batman. We're going to back out quietly. We're taking our loot, and we're taking Gordon. Detective Bullock there is dying. Make any move to follow us. Gordon dies. Batman simply glared back. He knew what choice he'd have to make. Outside police headquarters, Batman carried out the wounded bullet for the paramedics, but the police immediately pointed their guns at him. Before they could fire, a grappling hook shot out across the police line, then tightened, causing all the cops to fall back. Drake drove the bat cycle up to Batman. Go. If you feel like I'm not ready yet, you can walk. Go. Drake took off of Batman. Eventually, they made it to the Batcave. Alfred, have we picked up a signal yet? Uh, nothing so far, sir. Signal? From what? Knockout dart. I was aiming at Dent, but I hit Gordon. There's a built-in electronic tracer. No signal yet. It's 
probably means they're still underground. I've got relay sensors all over the city. If they come up for air, we'll know. The next day, across the Burnside neighborhood, families and small businesses mysteriously found themselves with large amounts of cash that appeared out of nowhere at their doorsteps. After committing the heist, Two-Face's second act was to spread the stolen money to his home neighborhood. At his underground hideout, Two-Face had Commissioner Gordon handcuffed to a railing while serving him a bottle of wine. Harvey, maybe you should just kill me now. We both know you'll have to sooner or later. I wanted to, but the coin said to let you live. Do you know what was in those armored vans from Lincoln Savings and Loans? Besides the money, documents, under federal subpoena, documents tying Lincoln Savings and Loans to- As Two-Face talked, Gordon accidentally knocked over the bottle of wine. Two-Face rushed to catch it. Jim, that's a 78 Domain du Yak. I'm sorry, Harvey. I do appreciate it. With his captor distracted, Gordon attached the bat knockout dart to Two-Face's pant leg. Moments later, over in the Batcave, Alfred saw a blinking light appear on the monitor of the Bat computer. Uh, sir, we've got a live signal traveling quite rapidly west from the Burnside district toward Gotham Park. I would assume it's a moving car. If Gordon were loose, he'd head straight for police headquarters. Just so, sir. Perhaps they're transporting him to a new hideout. Or maybe Gordon planted it on somebody else. Such as Mr. Dent? But Bruce was not the only one who heard Alfred. From her own hideout, Selena Kyle had been listening in to the whole conversation from her computer. Somehow, she had found a way to bug the Batcave. Meow. Batman tracked down the tracking device, finding Two-Face coming out of a florist shop. On the ground, Drake scoped out the nearby park and reported to Batman in his communicator. A couple of guys walking a circuit. Same two joggers keep running past. Cops is my guess. Plus, a couple of Mr. Dent's goons in the bush. Whatever's going down stinks. Barbara Gordon sat on a park bench next to her purse. A figure in a parka, holding roses, approached her from behind. Barbara? Harvey? You weren't followed. I'm a cop. I know how to lose a tail. Let me look at you. Don't! I just want to see your sweet face. It's been so long. Are you okay? Does it hurt? I came to tell you. All our dreams of what we could accomplish together, they're coming true. Not quite in the way we expected, but... I believe you, darling. You'll come back from all this. Between the fire, the pain, the drugs, you'll get a slap on the wrist, and after that... No, Barbara. That door's closed. You don't understand what I've done. It doesn't matter, Harvey. Barbara suddenly had a gun on Harvey, shifting her tone of voice. You're under arrest. Put one cuff on your wrist and one on the arm of the bench. Everyone on the sidelines watched. Barbara's cops waited for Two-Face to handcuff himself before moving in. While Two-Face's men waited to see what their boss would do next, they were under strict orders not to shoot Barbara. Batman called into Drake. If she takes him in, we have no way of finding Gordon. It's her party. What's the play? Batman had to think quickly. Meanwhile, Barbara kept the gun on Two-Face, feeling conflicted. I love you, Harvey, but I have to bring you in. Barbara, we both know there's no version of reality where you pull that trigger. Oh, I won't shoot to kill, but I'll make real sure you don't run away. She pointed her gun at his leg. Then I guess I should tell you. I have your father. You what?! Just then, 
Catwoman leaped from a tree and pounced on Barbara, knocking her to the ground. She looked up at Two-Face. Run, you idiot! The cops ran in, firing as Dent ran away. Drake charged in and tracked down Catwoman. She wasn't such an urban legend, after all. Catwoman. You follow Dent. I'll catch up. Batman followed Two-Face as he ran across the street, avoiding speeding cars and trying to reach his hideout. His two sides argued with each other. Traitors. She traitors. Survive, fool. Survive! Finally, Two-Face reached his hideout and his hostage, Commissioner Gordon. What'd you expect, Harvey? She's a cop! It's all changed since the accident. I've seen it in the way she looks at me. And my face. Tragedy doesn't change you, Harvey. It reveals you. Maybe she's finally seen what you always were. A spineless opportunist. No real sense of right and wrong. Just a finger in the air to see which way the wind was blowing. Now you've got your little coin to tell you what you can and can't do. As if you're not responsible for your own choices. If you weren't such a pitiful weakling, you'd be... Two-Face had spun around, shooting Commissioner Gordon. Happy now, old man. Yes, Harvey. Thank you. You've done me a, a big favor. She loves you. She'd forgive anything. But she'll never forgive you. For this. Oh. Gordon lay on the ground. Motionless. He was dead. Two-Face put his hands over his head, realizing what he had done. You fool! The coin said to let him live! Shut up! It doesn't matter. Nothing matters! It matters to me. Two-Face turned to see Batman emerge from the shadows, having just arrived on the scene. Despite finding Gordon's body, he still tried one more attempt to reach his friend. Harvey, it's over now. I want to help you. You've helped me enough. Do you know what's in this briefcase? More power than I ever dreamed of having. Two-Face broke off in a run, but Batman caught him with a batarang. Two-Face squirmed on the ground before pulling a detonator out of his jacket pocket. The tunnel collapsed on Batman. As the dust settled, Two-Face approached the body, seeing that part of the Dark Knight's cowl had been ripped off. You called us Harvey. Why so familiar? He turned to Batman's face and gasped, <gasps> finding himself looking into the eyes of his friend, Bruce Wayne. Can't be. It can't be! He quickly pulled out his camera and took pictures before he heard the voices of Drake and Catwoman approaching. A body in the rubble. I, I, I think it's Gordon. Two-Face ran off as Drake and Catwoman found Batman's body, with Bruce's face exposed. We gotta get him to- No hospitals. We'll take him home. To Alfred. You know who he is? Of course I do. And I know who you are, Drake. The next morning in Wayne Manor, Bruce woke up to find Catwoman in his room. She had reclaimed Miss Kitty, who was sitting on her lap. Oh, Selena. Three cracked ribs, dislocated ankle, a few bad sprains. You'll be out of action for a while. What's in the briefcase? Oh, back to work already? Harvey had it on him. You want it. What's in it? Well, you remember that heist you broke up? That Lincoln Savings and Loan robbery was executed by Lincoln Savings and Loan. See, they had paperwork that had to vanish in a hurry. 
For years they've been laundering money for the mob and kicking it back to the politicians, leaving pennies for improving the city. Then, you came along and boom! The incriminating documents are sitting in the police evidence room. As long as Harvey has that briefcase, he owns one governor, one senator, one mayor, and one brand new police commissioner. Oh, and I left one out. Harvey saw your face in the tunnel. He owns Bruce Wayne. Over at City Hall, Two-Face held court with the mayor and the city council. We're more than willing to listen to Harvey. Just tell us what you want. It's a short list. Outstanding charges against me dropped. Ongoing investigations canceled. Harvey, that's going to be difficult. But you're going to do it anyway. Because from now on, I own you bloodsuckers. And you'll do everything I say. Calm down. If you want money, we'll cut you in. Sorry, boys. From now on, Gotham's money goes to Gotham. The gravy train stops here. And I know what you're thinking, but I warn you right now. If anything happens to me, your paper trail goes public, and the voters and the feds find out where you've been getting your money. Back at Wayne Manor, Bruce called Barbara Gordon to give his condolences on the death of her father. Barbara, uh, I'm so sorry. He was very kind to me once. He was a good man. After he hung up, Catwoman came to help him walk through the hallway. If we get our hands on that briefcase, the two of us could run this city. Together. <laughs> Maybe you should hook up with Harvey. Not funny. I've been thinking about this for months. About us. About yeah. Me too. That's a laugh. A whole year went by. You didn't know whether I was alive or dead. I looked. I didn't find you. Then I realized, as long as I didn't know for sure, there's a 50-50 chance you were still alive. That's when I stopped looking and you came back. Selena, do you ever want to be normal? Bruce and Selena pondered their future. Could he retire with her? Let Drake do the fighting on the streets? As they pondered this, Two-Face visited his old home at the Royal Garage. Mr. Otis was waiting for him. You get that parcel I sent you? I did. Where'd you get a half a million dollars, Harvey? That money was stolen from the people. I just stole it back. There were snipers at the station you robbed. They fired on a crowd of people. People that were marching for you. It was... necessary. I've got real power now. I can change this city. Make it better. For a while there, I thought you had started to care about all the folks you left behind. Look at me, Jerome. Can't you see what I've been through? My skin... burns. It festers. It reeks. It hurts to talk. Hurts to smile. Hurts to breathe. Handsomest man in Burnside. The young girls used to swoon when you smiled at them. That face would have carried you anywhere. But you know the old joke about time. Sooner or later, you get the face you deserve. Now, excuse me. I have to make a phone call. Mr. Otis turned to call the rest of the Burnside Council. He was going to denounce Harvey to the rest of the neighborhood. Two-Face knew he couldn't let that happen. He debated between both sides of himself. We can just walk away. We don't have to do this. Of course we do. Four people in my whole life. Four people have ever been kind to me. My mom, Jerome. Bruce, Barbara, we don't have to- Of course we do. The coin landed. Then Two-Face took aim at the man who raised him. (laughs) 
Moments later, Drake Winston arrived at the garage. Hey, Mr. Otis. You in here? You said I had a package. Hello? But as Drake stepped in, he was horrified to find that Mr. Otis was dead. Oh no! Oh no! He then saw Two-Face bent over the body, head in his hands. Open your package. Hundred grand to Junior Batman for saving my life. Aren't you sorry you did? Mr. Den, when I get through with you, the ugly side's gonna be the pretty side. The Two-Face ran out into the street, calling on the people of Burnside. Help! Somebody help me! He shot Jerome Otis! Drake attacked him, but a crowd gathered, grabbing him and tearing him off Harvey. In the garage, they found Mr. Otis's body and the cash. They took Drake to the police, believing he was the one who robbed and killed his mentor. Back at the Batcave, Bruce Wayne now sat in a wheelchair as he listened to the news about Drake's arrest. Alfred walked in to deliver more bad news. Mr. Dent just called requesting an audience. He said he would be here in 20 minutes. I'll be ready. And Alfred, don't interfere. We've got to play this one just right. True to his word, Two-Face arrived. Alfred brought him down to the Batcave, where he confronted Bruce by the Batmobile and the giant Lincoln's head penny. Nice coin. How about I see yours? The one that changes destiny. Why not? Since you work for me now. Two-Face flipped the coin to Bruce, who caught it. Harvey then held up the picture he took of Bruce in the tunnel. The cops see this if I happen to predecease you for any reason. Are you feeling a little more cooperative? You don't have to kill me if you can, Harvey. Right now is the best chance you'll ever get. If you insist. But wait, here's the other side of the coin. We could fix your face, get you healthy. Meanwhile, I'm off rounding up the bad guys. A few months in therapy to straighten out, and you come home a hero. By then, I've retired. Every dime I have is at your disposal. Together, we clean up the city. The right way. No. I've gone too far. I can't turn back. Put the coin aside. Bruce flipped the coin back to Two-Face, who caught it. Two-Face took a moment, then flipped the coin. But high above, Catwoman had been watching. She used her claws to slice the ropes holding up the giant penny, sending it rolling over to Harvey. Harvey! Two-Face fell back over the edge, but caught himself on a ledge below. Bruce did his best to run over on his injured legs, throwing a rope to Harvey. Hang on! It's okay, Bruce. I can see it like it's lit up before me. The path to the future. Every choice we have to make. And it's beautiful. We're old men, Bruce. We're friends. And we made a difference. The people's lives are better. Happier. And Barbara, she forgives me. The two Gothams, they're one now. It was all worth it. They don't need us anymore. We can... We can finally let go. A whip cracked in the air, cutting the rope, sending Two-Face falling into the abyss. Shocked, Bruce turned to see Catwoman wrapping up her whip. How, how could you do that? I think you mean to say thank you. He would have killed you if the coin had- No, Selena, I rigged the game. I palmed his coin, gave him back a fake. Two heads, both clean. I win the toss either way. 
There was no reason for him to die. Oh, you and your messiah complex. He was broken, Bruce. Too far gone for you to save. I thought I could save him. I thought I could save you. You thought what? Last Christmas, I was wrong. We're not the same, Selena. I hoped we were, but we're not. I'm not a killer. Not a killer? Please. I heard what you did to the Joker. The Red Triangle Circus? Penguin? Maybe I was, but not Amy. I can't be. If there's anything I've learned from you, it's that. Here I was chasing those stolen documents for months, but silly me. I thought saving your life was more important. Maybe I should have hooked up with Harvey. She looked down and found Two-Face's coin. Harvey had dropped it when he fell over the ledge. She picked it up, finding that the coin still had the scarred side. Oh, and look what you did. You gave him his own coin back. No. That's not possible. Goodbye forever, Bruce. Oh, and Miss Kyle wants her cat back. You can keep the collar. As Catwoman left with Miss Kitty, Bruce looked at the red collar she left behind. Inside was a small microphone. Catwoman had been spying on him the entire time. Bruce stayed in the Batcave that night, in mourning over his former friend and the future he thought he had with Selina. That week, Harvey Dent's death hit the news. Barbara Gordon was in mourning at her apartment until a package arrived. When she opened it, her mouth dropped open in shock. <gasps> Inside were photos from Harvey revealing that Bruce Wayne was Batman. While she wondered what to do, Selina Kyle drafted a letter to Barbara. That explosive evidence from your late fiancé was illegally acquired. It may be tainted, inadmissible in court, but I have access to certain private communications that might help you find the hard evidence you need to close out the case Mr. Dent was working on. That case will incriminate Gotham City's power elite. You should decide straight away whether you are willing to make such powerful enemies. If you are, I'll be delighted to help you. I hope you will think of me as your friend, your guide, and if I may be so bold, your... Oracle. Soon, Bruce recovered from his injuries and went down into the rocks in the Batcave. He wasn't able to find Two-Face's body. But he did find his gun. After giving it to the GCPD, they matched it to the one that killed Mr. Otis and set Drake free. Bruce had Alfred pick Drake up from jail and brought him over to Wayne Manor, where he led him into his garage. Here, you'll need the keys. Two clicks. As Drake clicked on the keys, the bat cycle appeared, uncloaking itself. Nice. Anything else I can give you? The little girl, Nasha Burroughs? We're setting her up with a $10 million trust fund. That's just it, Mr. Wayne? She's got nobody. All of that money, she'll have relatives, friends, neighbors coming out of the woodwork. They'll look at her and see a dollar sign. He must know what that's like. What do you propose I do? My sister lives upstate, married. Husband has a good job, but they can't have kids. They've adopted too. If my sister could adopt that little girl, she'll grow up loved, wanted, have a normal life. And if you still wanted to give her that money, in 20 years or Leave it to her in your will. Well, if you help me with this, I swear, I'll never tell her why you really did it. Bruce considered. He fantasized about a world in which things had gone differently. Maybe he and Selena could have been together. Maybe they'd have adopted children, taken Naisha in themselves. Maybe his parents would have still been alive. Maybe... Mr. Wayne? I'll see that Naisha gets the family she needs. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Mm. 
Bruce. They shook hands. Drake then donned his costume, preparing to take the bat cycle home. By the way, Drake, what am I calling you these days? Well, you're a bat guy. I'm a bird guy. What do you think? He nodded towards the R insignia on his chest, then winked. And with that, Drake, or as he'd be known from then on, Robin, took off into the night with his new cycle. And will you be going out, sir? When you asked, I haven't decided. Bruce pulled out Harvey's coin from his pocket. Which side of him would he be honoring tonight? Bruce Wayne the Philanthropist? Or Batman the Vigilante? Bruce flipped the coin to find out. This audio drama is brought to you by Newverse Creative and features the voice talents of Josh Portillo, Derek Willingham, Angela Heffler, Alexander Pond, Lauren King, Lauren Sanders, Christopher Anderson II, Anthony Williams, Tommy Ricard, A.J. Carter, Davis Allen, and Harrison Toomey. Narrated by Ben Wan. This audio drama is based on a comic book written by Sam Hamm and was adapted by Ben Wan. Directed and edited by Tim Maxwell. If you're a fan of this comic, check out my podcast, Superhero Stuff You Should Know, where I dove into each issue and interviewed writer Sam Hamm, artist Joe Quinones, and editor Andy Curry. And if you're a fan of how I adapted this comic for Newverse Creative, Check out my short story titled Shortcut to Happily Ever After at Metaphorosis Magazine. You can find the link along with a bunch of my other work at my website, benwanwriter.com. Batman 89, Shadows. Batman was created by Bob Kane, with Bill Finger, based on characters appearing in DC Comics. Soon, from Newverse Creative. Riddle me this, Fred! What is everything to someone, and nothing to everyone else? Your mind! In an uncertain world, in a chaotic time, Justice wears a mask. Batman does not kill? What if it was slain during his fight with Jack and Ape, the Joker? Love is a game. Let's just say I could write a heck of a paper on why a grown man dresses up like a flying rodent. Bats aren't rodents, Dr. Meridian. Power is a machine. Question marks, Mr. Wayne. My work raises so many question marks! Here's one for you. Why hasn't anybody put you in your place? And revenge is a trap. The bet must die! <laughs> Courage now. I saved your bad butt back there. I think a little appreciation is in order. Truth always. Who's the boy wonder, Batman? Experience the original Batman forever. Finally performed in the style of the Burton verse. I see without seeing. To me, darkness is as clear as daylight. What am I? Batman 3, based on the screenplay by Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor with Akiva Goldsman. Adapted by Ben Wan from superhero stuff you should know. 
My parents were murdered in front of me. I was just a kid. I can't remember exactly what happened. But now there's a new element. A red leather book. Coming soon. Coming soon from Newverse Creative. In Gotham City, chaos runs through the streets. Gang members, calling themselves the Bat Boys, are being blamed for a series of violent attacks. The Bat Boys rule Gotham now. I will prosecute vigilantes to the fullest extent of the law. Now, Gotham's darkest hero must face two new threats. Heard told me this. When there's a billionaire like a swine. When he's a boar! Whatever dreams you had for this city, Nigma, I'm gonna put a stop to them. You want to preserve this dump of a city? Well, I just want to burn it down and start over. Fear is the greatest level. Don't you think, Batman? We all have something to fear. Tremble before the scarecrow. This time, he's not alone. Who's our young friend? I'm Nightwing. Payback's a witch, and so am I. Tomorrow's the beginning of the end. For the old ways. The old money. The old powers of Gotham. Better luck next time, big guy. We'll soon see what you fear, Batman. Newverse Creative presents Batman Enigma, the audio drama. Based on the fan comic by Ian Miller, Eric Elliott, and Paul Brian McCoy. Coming soon for an experience you'll never forget. and observations. Year one, September 4th. Father, mother, what should I do? Years ago, Darren Aronofsky and Frank Miller wrote the screenplay for Batman, year one. Now Newverse Creative brings the unmade script to life adapting it as a prequel to the Batman. I walk the streets, disguising myself as a drifter. I witness what's become of the city my father tried to save. What I see enrages me. When are you going to live again? Not as this, but as Bruce Wayne. The little boy is dead. I've declared my war on crime. Now, you must fight back for what's been lost. Fear is a tool. Do you notice anything odd about these men, Doctor? Other than claiming to get attacked by a giant bat, 
I'm talking about their spirit. These men are broken. I'm scared. If criminals are superstitious and cowardly, then my disguise must strike terror in their hearts. Please, please! Must become a creature of the night. I've been wondering when you're going to go off. But this, this is something else. Yes, Father. I shall become a bat. Adapted by Ben Wan from Superhero Stuff, you should know.